Canada has just set up its very own cyber center, a federal body that advises citizens and businesses, develops security tools and measures for our digital society. But are we doing enough? Our next guest was once on the FBI's most wanted list. He is now a white hat hacker with a consulting business and works with an AI company to develop new defense systems against cyber attacks. Kevin Mitnick joins us now from the RBC Capital Markets Point of View Conference. Good to be with you, Kevin. Hey, thank you for having me on your show. All right, so when I talk to anyone in uh, different realms of Canadian business, whether it's banking or it's our central bank, they're all concerned about the threat posed by cyber attacks. Uh, we have this new agency in Canada. From your point of view, you take a look at what's happening right now in North America and Canada. Are we doing enough? No, I don't think we're doing enough. I think we need to do more. I think uh, businesses and governments have to be much more proactive at mitigating the risk. And I hope that this agency that's been formed helps actually uh, do that, actually accomplishes that objective. Now, when we think about how technology just runs through every part of our life, there's so many, so many different avenues to explore. Let's start with the political one. There, there's a lot of concern about what happened in the U.S. Uh, election in 2016. We have midterms coming up in the United States. We have a federal election in this country coming up next year. How vulnerable are we still to these kind of attacks and influence on our democratic process? Well, I'm not sure if I can really say how vulnerable we are. What I can say is these government, agency, government agencies, whether or not they're decentralized like they are in the United States, they really need to test their security controls to make sure it's extremely difficult for a threat actor to compromise those controls. With John Podesta, he was victimized through what we call a spear phishing attack. So what that means is people inside government also have to be made aware of exactly what phishing and spear phishing attacks are and actually to be trained about these types of threats so they don't fall victim to them. Now, this seems key to me, and I find that this part of it very interesting. When we think about uh, people launching cyber attacks, the, the best hackers in the world, we think of them diving into lines of code, stuff that the average person can't understand. But as you pointed out, you get someone in government who just opens the wrong email and, and clicks on a link, and that's the entry point. That is, that's the low-hanging fruit, but it works. It, work, it works extremely well. In fact, I run a company uh, where we do security testing, where clients around the globe hire us to break in to test their security controls. And the first thing that we do is actually conduct a spear phishing campaign, and our success rate is 99.9% that we're going to get inside the company. And then we use technical means to try to gain access to other computers and servers and so on. Well, when you're trying to hack into this, is, this fascinates me as well, because sometimes I'll admit I get locked out of my own computer because I forget my password. When you are trying to hack into well, a you system, should call me. <laughs> you say, what are your kids' names? And then you pretty much crack the code. <laughs> I just told national television. But well, when you're trying to crack a, a company's system, well, what do you do first? Are you trying to do that hard crack into the code and go through, through it? Or are you just trying to do a simple phishing exercise to see if you can fool someone in that company just letting you walk right through the door? Well, phishing, for sure, like I mentioned before, but also what companies aren't aware of is pretext phone calls. So attackers calling people inside the business over the phone and tricking them, pretending they're, for example, with, an IT, they're with the IT department or they're a vendor, tricking them to give information about their computer, what software they're running, and also pretending they're from the IT department, maybe to do something like a password reset or this sort of thing. The other, okay, so if the social engineering, which encompasses pretext phone calls and encompasses spear phishing attacks do not, doesn't work, then attackers look at internet-facing websites. So a lot of companies have portals that customers and partners could log into. And don't forget, web applications are built usually with thousands of lines of code. So there's, there's always flaws. So what's hackers try to do is find these flaws and exploit them so they can gain access to the company through their vulnerable web application. Now, obviously, we've seen a lot of high-profile instances of security protocols, but big companies being breached. At the same time, though, sometimes I think, why doesn't it happen more often? I, I think about the fact that our uh, energy infrastructure, the, uh, the hydro grid, so many things. I mean, uh, conceivably, a hacker could get in there and turn off the lights for the eastern seaboard. How are we preventing these things from happening at the moment? Well, that's critical infrastructure. So you have government, you have companies that support critical infrastructure that are responsible for deploying 
best of breed security controls. They're responsible for testing these things, but it's absolutely critical. In fact, when I was a black, black hat hacker back in the 80s and 90s, I compromised most of the phone companies in the United States, and it was like a walk in the park. I pray today it's much harder because now we have to be concerned about terrorist threats and other nation state attacks. So government needs to regulate this area, and the companies that support critical, critical infrastructure need to meet a certain standard to mitigate the risk. Unfortunately, there's no silver bullet to eliminate the risk, but what they could do is raise that bar extremely high to make it really hard for a nation state to compromise us. Lastly, I want to ask you, Kevin, given your expertise in this field, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, are they as bulletproof as we are told they are? Well, I believe in the crypto, but you have to think if you're a consumer of a cryptocurrency, where are you hosting your wallet? Is that third-party company secure? Could they, get, could, they, could they get hacked and your cryptocurrency stolen? Or are you keeping the wallet on your own personal computer? And what if malware ends up on your computer and is able to install a keylogger so they can get your secret passphrase to your crypto keys that lock your wallet, and then they run off with your entire wallet. So nowadays, automated tools like bots are doing these types of, types of attack. It's not a human being doing it. So there is definitely risk to using cryptocurrencies, and that's why consumers need to be more aware of these risks. All right, Kevin, fascinating stuff. Thanks for joining us.